Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Today I'd like to look at the parable of the rich young man. Um, this is the, the reading on, at Mass on Sunday recently, and it sort of put me in mind of something I'd been wanting to talk about. Um, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read the version from Mark, which doesn't actually identify him as young. That's Matthew. But anyway, it's the, it's the same story. And this one, I, I particularly like this for just the aspect of this I'd like to talk about. So here's the reading. As he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these things I have observed from my youth. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him, and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. At that saying his countenance fell, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. So, <coughs> pardon, um, there's one observation I'd like to throw in before the, the main thrust, which is um, something I've always found interesting, is that in all three tellings, it's very ambiguous what the man then did. Um, it's simply not specified. Um, and, and I've seen commentary taking it in both directions. Uh, very commonly is the idea that the young man didn't go and sell his possessions and simply refused to follow Jesus. And, and there's plenty of commentary, and that's a very valid interpretation. But it's also possible, based upon what we're actually told, that the young man was just very sad because he was going to lose all that he had and found this attachment very hard to break, but that he went to go do it. That he did go to sell what he had, he was just really, really sad that he had to go do this. That, that he didn't expect the price to be so high. And um, so I, both of these, I, I, so far as I know, are entirely valid interpretations. You'll find that the former one, I think, more commonly. Um, but you will find both. And one of the things about Scripture, being inspired by God, is that every true thing you can learn from Scripture is intentional. God doesn't put things in by accident. There's, there's no such thing as, as a story meaning something true and God not being aware of that. So every true thing you can learn from Scripture is actually intentional. Now, the main point that I would like to talk about is about the concept of riches, because they're really, to be rich means really two different things, although they can often overlap. The very common usage is relative riches, to be rich in a relative sense. That is, you take people, you, you know, um, plot them on the, the whatever curve of wealth possession you have, and then you, you look at the you know, topmost 1%, 3%, 5%, whatever. And those are the rich. And so, you know, if you have a collection of beggars, you know, having to, to eat rats, most of them have one rat and a few of them have two rats. Those beggars with two rats are amongst their peers wealthy or rich. So there's that sort of definition, rarely applied in this case because everyone always compares beggars to someone else. But um, nonetheless, this is the relative definition, and I use the example of the beggars just to illustrate that the relative definition will always, unless everybody has exactly uniform, you know, material possessions, this will always produce somebody being wealthy in any group. Now, the other meaning of wealthy, which in the ancient world pretty much relied upon uh, relative wealth, was, is having the ability to conform your environment to your desires. So, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, t take the, the modern case, those of us who own homes. When it's hot out, we want it to be cool and have air conditioning. When it's cold out, we want it to be warm and we have heat. And within our homes, we are able to conform our environment to what we want. We're able to not need a thick coat in winter 
And I mean, heck, for those who have thick coats, they want to be warm, and so the thick coat keeps them warmer than just being naked in winter would do. These are all absolute wealth. They are all the ability to conform your environment, your immediate environment, to what you want, to what you want it to be. Now, in the ancient world, as I said, this generally relied on, I mean, there's some level of wealth, absolute wealth, you know, having tunics and cloaks and so on, having clothes to shelter you from the rain, um, you know, having the ability to, to procure food. So e even in the ancient world, there was some amount of that. Um, but, so, I mean, some amount of this is required simply to stay alive. And so um, it's really, what really comes to the fore here is the amount of wealth such that you can generally conform your circumstances. Like having enough food to eat when you get hungry is conforming your circumstances to what you want, but on the other hand, that's only, you know, one fraction of life, and then there's, you know, plenty of life. But a very rich person in the ancient world who had lots of slaves could have his slaves go and doing the work necessary to make his environment much more like what he wanted. They didn't have air conditioning back then, but they, they did have shade and you could have people fan you and so on. So there are some things that you could do at the time they'd you know, get in cool drinks and so on. Um, so there, even back then there were things, but they largely depended upon having wealth much more in the sense of like having servants and having your slaves in the, the ancient world and having um, slaves required you to be relatively wealthy because you have to be wealthier than your slaves. Um, or they wouldn't be your slaves. And, you know, most people can't have many slaves, definitionally. If ever, you know, if, if you somehow had, um, you know, if many people have, say, 10 slaves, well, then each of those slaves doesn't have any slaves. And so, you know, you still have a, you know, one to 10 relationship. So in the ancient world, you really don't need to specify the distinction between relative wealth and absolute wealth, because you could only have absolute wealth in a sort of extreme sense, if you're relatively wealthy. By contrast, in the modern world, we have a lot of technology. And in a sense, you can you can legitimately describe much of our technology as slaves. Like, you know, I have a pair of slaves um, that do my laundry for me. One of them is called the washing machine, and one of them is called the dryer. Um, in the ancient world, you would need somebody to actually go and do all this work and, you know, rub the things, you know, get the clothing wet and rub it and rub it and and so on, and then spread it out in the sunshine, and so on. Whereas, you know, I just stick it in a machine, press a button, and it happens. So I have the equivalent ability to control my environment, to make my clothing clean when I want it clean, um, that required a slave in the ancient world. I don't have nearly the amount of relative wealth by having just a washing machine. I'm um, thinking it cost a few hundred dollars, and it's not very expensive to run. Um, you know, and, and you know, if you don't own one, you can go to a laundromat. It's what I you know, used to do when I didn't own a washing machine. And, you know, nonetheless, you are still getting the ability to conform your environment to yourself of this. Now, um, I, I, hopefully that's well established, that, the, that one version of wealth is the ability to conform your environment to yourself. I could give a lot more examples, but I, I want to try to make this video not absurdly long. So um, just think of anything else where technology enables you to realize your desire without having to do the you know, all of the labor yourself, and this is wealth allowing you to conform your environment to your desires. Why is this, why does this make it so hard to enter the kingdom of heaven? Because I contend that of the two, relative wealth and absolute wealth, it's absolute wealth that really is the much more dangerous of the two. <coughs> Pardon me, I need a drink of water. It's absolute wealth, I contend, which is the thing that makes it hard to enter the kingdom of heaven, and why? And I really like the line in this version where Jesus says, uh, those who trust in wealth. Because what does conforming your environment to your will do? It makes you think you fit into your environment. It makes you think that things are natural, that you actually fit here. Now, and there are two aspects to this. One, we're fallen creatures, and to be unaware that we are fallen is to be catastrophically mistaken. So the more that you can convince yourself that you are not actually a fallen creature in a fallen world, but that everything is perfect, the more you are <clears throat> focusing on the immediate and neglecting what's actually true. You're turning yourself away from the truth. And you're, you're burrowing yourself into what is essentially a lie. The other part is that because it's a fallen world, conforming it to yourself is essentially 
it's not quite necessarily, but in practice, always amounts to neglecting God. Because the world is, properly speaking, oriented towards God, and it's supposed to be oriented towards God in a particular way that God created it. By conforming it to yourself in a different way than God created the world to be, you are... there's an element in which you're rebelling against God, but you are also conforming... the thing is, in a, in a metaphorical sense, pointed away from God. When, you know, when you're using food as a, a source of pleasure to make yourself feel you know, not, not to partake in the gift of life from God to you and to take pleasure in the ordering of the world, you know, as God did in giving you existence, but rather in taking yourself simply as a food eating thing. And so you are fulfilling what you are, the essence of yourself in the eating of the food in, you know, in the same way, not taking sex as, as being God's gift of, of taking part in the act of creation with him, but rather that you know, that you're a groin thrusting machine and that you're, you know, now able to appropriately thrust your groin repeatedly, um, you know, that, that this is the sum total of what you are. These sorts of comfortable lies are turning you away from God because they're taking one small aspect, making that the whole, and then directing your attention entirely that way. So that whereas the things are naturally oriented to God, Wealth allows you to pretend that they really aren't, that they're sufficient unto themselves. And that's why I contend that absolute wealth makes it so hard to enter the kingdom of God, because it makes it so easy to pretend you're already there, in a sense. It's, it's so easy to pretend that you're already there and you don't even need God to be in the kingdom of God. As, of course, the, the kingdom of God is, you know, fulfilling your, your telos, your natural end. Um, and so that... I think is something very concerning for all of us in the modern world with our vast technology that gives most people armies of slaves that do our bidding. You know, you get into a car and you have the equivalent of, of you know, a dozen slaves carrying you on a chair somewhere. Um, you know, they can keep going for mile after mile after mile and never need to rest and so on. So in an absolute sense, almost everybody in the modern world, in wealthy countries like America, um, you know, in Europe and Australia and Japan and you know, a large fraction of the world and very rapidly increasing throughout the world. Um, an awful lot of us are, you know, for, from, you know, towards the bottom to the top. I mean, America is an especially wealthy country, um, but you have to be really, really far down in America in the relative wealth possession sense before you don't have any technology that does things for you. Um, e even people who have very little still have a lot in a absolute sort of sense. Um, you know, shelter and clothing, transportation, um, you know, very few people in America have to go down to a stream and wash their clothing in it and then, you know, beat it with rocks and hang it out in the sun to dry. Um, that's just not, you know, lay it out on the grass to dry. Like that's, you know, very few people have to spin their own clothing. Um, so, so... Uh, you know, very few people are naked. It, it exists, but the thing is, most of us have a lot of possessions. Most of us have a lot of technology that enables us to conform our environment to our desires. But most of us don't think of ourselves as rich because we're not rich in a, in a relative sense. They're, they're people much, much, much wealthier than most of us. And so it's really easy to fool ourselves into thinking that we're not in this sort of danger. Um, you know, I've seen this, you know, I'm not on team, you know, I'm not in the wealthy tribe, I'm in the, the average person tribe, so they're the bad ones, and we're the good ones, and, you know, bad stuff happened to them, and everything will be fine. Attitude, not, not actual belief. Um, and it's easy to slip into that, because we're mistaking relative wealth for absolute wealth. But it's very, very important, as technology is ever getting better, and making us all ever more powerful over our environment, it's all the more important to remember that this applies to us, that our mere ability to, our ability to conform our environment to our circumstances is essentially, it's not that it's inherently bad, but it can very easily be a lie. And so that's why all wealth is a tool, but a tool that has to be used extremely carefully. Now, uh, it's something, you know, um, 
you don't have to look very hard to find examples of where Jesus is recommending that people with wealth do good things with it. I mean, for example, this man's supposed to sell his, you know, give his wealth to the poor. This is an act of generosity that he's supposed to do. He's supposed to do good with this wealth. He, you know, he wasn't told, you know, go home and burn it so that no one can, you know, this, this, you know, get rid of this blight of, of, you know, material things from the world. It's not Gnostic. Um, I mean, not the Gnostics said that anyway. They, they're scam. Oh, Gnosticism is its own topic. They had this great scam where they, they were the spiritual ones. They couldn't be corrupted by matter. So they'll sleep with people's wives and give them stuff. But A, it was dangerous for everyone else. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um, scams like Gnosticism aside, which, which crop up from time to time, and you will see. Um, but scams like Gnosticism aside, um, you will see, you know, again, the, the story of Zacchaeus, of where he, he then announced that he would make restitution. If he cheated anyone, he'll pay him back fourfold. And Jesus announced that salvation come to this household. The man didn't renounce all of his wealth. The man used it well. Or again, the centurion. Um, I can't remember which gospel. But the, the Jewish elders came to Jesus and told him that there's this centurion who deserves well of him. He, he, built, the, uh, uh, he built the local synagogue. You know, now centurion was a, if he's building a synagogue, he's a reasonably wealthy man, but he did good with his wealth. Um, and Jesus certainly doesn't rebuke the centurion for being wealthy or for having done good with his wealth. So wealth is a useful tool. Um, Jesus himself said, you know, money is, is a good servant, but a poor master. So it's not that money is bad. It's not that wealth is bad. It's not that wealth damns you or guarantees your damnation, but rather it is difficult to enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, bear in mind, by the way, um, in the Greek, uh, the kingdom of, uh, kingdom of uh, Basileia, um, it's closely related to the word, uh, the verb to rule, basiline. Uh, a king rules over his kingdom, but the kingdom is, it's the same word. Um, in, in English, it's kind of different. It, it's, it, it'd be something like the, the like, ruledom would be more like a, a more, um, it's not, I don't mean literal translation, but to like have the sense of it. We call it a kingdom, but um, in Greek, the words that that, um, that you'd find in the actual in the gospel, the um, the kingdom of God is that place through which God's rule is observed, um, where God's rule is you know is actually the law that is followed. So when we say the kingdom of God, we're not referring to um, to like a particular like like you know, a demarcation of an area, but rather a mode of being, that to enter the kingdom of heaven is to do what you're supposed to do according to, to how your creator made you. Um, so it's very hard to be the creature you are supposed to be, to do what you as a creature are supposed to do when you are wealthy, because in this fallen world, wealth allows you to mislead yourself into thinking you're already doing that when you're not. And if you think you're already doing something, you're not going to fix, you know, correctly, you're not going to fix yourself. And so that's, one of the reasons why wealth in this absolute sense is so dangerous and why this is such a big danger in the modern world when we're all so wealthy in this absolute sense. So, um, that's the uh, thoughts I wanted to share. Um, hope you found it interesting or useful. God bless you, and until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.